So how are you gonna make good product photos without a million dollar studio, a phase one and five score packs? If you wanna compete against professional photographers, you need the absolute best and the absolute most expensive gear you can get your hands on. Uh, wait, uh, no, 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 sorry. The exact opposite of that, I mean. If you have a camera, a lens and a flash, maybe a plastic folding table, by the end of today's video, you're gonna be able to spot common pitfalls in beginner product photography, how to fix them in your own portfolio and how to create exciting works of art out of non-exciting objects. And I'll tell you a bit more about why that's important in a little bit. So let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Sergio and I'm a commercial photographer here in Victoria, BC. The very first mistake I noticed in beginner product photography are cash lights. No fuss about it. Before we get too deep into today's video, just keep in mind I'm not lifting my nose up from the top of a hill, poo-pooing everyone's work but my own. Like I, I did all of these mistakes we're gonna talk about. You have to learn it at some point anyway, so no shame here. I'm just trying to point out a couple little things that are maybe keeping your product photography from reaching that next level. So catch lights, right? We spoke a bit about these in my portrait video from the other week, but I find choosing the right catch light for portraits is much easier than for products. There's no one size fits all approach like, you know, window lights are square and the sunlight is round but instead you kind of want to look at the shape and the material of the actual thing you're photographing and apply the most appropriate lighting for the viewer to be able to make a 3D sense of this 2D object. That's what we're really doing here. We're, we're making 3D representations of 2D products. How do you make a circle look spherical? How do you make a square look cubic? Those are those nuances that you have to train yourself to look out for. Think back to our portraits video. You can choose no catch lights if it fits your story, but it does tend to lead to a much more lifeless looking image. Unlike with portrait work, one of the most identifying traits of a beginner product photo is being able to easily make out that modifier. It's not as much of an issue with portraits because usually the eyeball and much less the catch light itself makes up for a relatively small portion of the overall frame. However, with product work, sometimes the catch light can literally be a third of the photo. Of course, once you train yourself to look at product images and understand how to light them, you'll be able to make out how to light any image you see. But what I mean is that if you see an octobox in the reflection of a face cleanser, it's no bueno. That's why scrims and flags are such an invaluable piece of equipment in product photography because they allow you to shape the light source from any small reflector to the exact shape and size you need for any product you're shooting. I go over how to create gradients on pieces of glass on this episode right here of Learn to Light. I'll link it in the description if anything, but as an easy quick workaround to really reflective products that you're having a hard time photographing, Maybe try lighting them from behind. Highly reflective products can leave very nasty and distracting reflections when lit. So sometimes lighting a product from the back and using reflectors to bounce light back onto the front of that product makes for a much, much more flattering image. Try it next time you're shooting beverages or liquids or even clear bottles. I really believe you can get away with one light for the vast majority of product photography workflows. And I think it's important to master how much you can squeeze out of that one light with various reflectors because Every time you add an extra light onto your subject, you're actually adding an extra catch light as well. So that's an extra catch light you have to manage and make look flattering. It's just one more thing to think about. Now, what about a specular highlight versus a white interior? Well, again, no rules, but specular will give you a shinier, more you know, wet-ish look to the product, which may or may not be what you're looking for. If you're photographing something like leather or a suede shoe, for example, you're probably gonna wanna use a non-specular highlight but again, there's no rules here. Just, just experiment. See what looks best, see what you like, and compare your work to real ads that you see out in the wild. Try to pick apart why yours doesn't look like theirs. And if you think it does, it probably doesn't. At least not yet. So think of those catch lights in your next image and try to make them as flattering as possible to highlight the subject that you're working with. Maybe get yourself a continuous LED that fits your modifiers so that you can just move the light around and see how it really affects your product in real time. I use an Aperture Amaran, I think it's a 60D. Uh, I think I'll, I'll link it down below if you're interested. But at the end of the day, I just want your take home to be light with purpose. And next up on our list of how to avoid looking like a beginner, I want you to put your product first in product photography. Yes, you wanna light the scene beautifully, but none of your lighting decisions matter if your picture is a Where's Waldo of props. Oh damn, I love those books. That and the uh, I Spy and the little word find crossword puzzles. Hmm, maybe that's why my work looks the way it does. <laughs> anyway, you don't want your subject to be lost in a sea of props. You're more than welcome to build a nice accompanying scene to your product with motivated props that help sell your story. But just make sure that your product, the thing that you're actually making an ad for, 
is the first thing that your audience looks at. So I've got my computer here, we're gonna open it up and we'll go through a couple examples together just to really show you what I'm talking about. So you guys might've seen this image here from my generative AI video. It's actually a, the photo that inspired that video. Uh, but I'm in like a food prep warehouse for this shoot. And I didn't really have much to work with, so I just kind of pulled some props from the kitchen. And I do quite like it. I feel like you're instantly able to tell that it's an, inspire, an Asian inspired meal without even looking at the food. So that's job well done for the props in my opinion. All right, so this one here, actually this is an example of something that I think doesn't really work. Uh, it needs a little bit more work in my, in my opinion. It's a bit of like a hodgepodge of props. I don't know, I, I wanted to use this background that was staring back at me for months, but I just feel like the whole composition is a little bit forced. I'm not totally against the image, but it does play well in today's idea of kind of like where's Waldoing your photos. Can you tell that this photo is just an ad for a laces company that stands the test of time? I, I was kind of going for like a little bit of a Salvador Dali persistence of memory type thing. And uh, it's new, it's different. Um, I don't know, image is fine, it's not great. The lighting on the spoon's pretty cool though. Originally when I created this, my thought was to make kind of like a bedside table, catch all kind of nightstand looking thing. Uh, obviously for someone who really likes pink, but <laughs> I know there's some random stuff there and I don't know, you might think this, is this an ad for AirPods or is this something for the camera? But hopefully you can get an idea of how props and risers can really help to accompany the scene but can also ruin it by being too much. It's like finding that real balance between the two. There's no real rule, but just looking at your work as analytically as you're currently looking at mine is probably a good start. Now, kind of in the opposite direction, the most important beginner pitfall that I definitely fell into was not connecting with the subject on an emotional level. Yeah, you wanna light it well. Yeah, you wanna put the subject first, but you also wanna create an emotional connection between the viewer and the product. And that starts with your personal connection with that product. Even if it's a paperclip, a candied apple, or a bottle of orangina. Find what it is that you love about it and try to tell a story between that. Being able to emotionally connect with an audience far outweighs any technical triple diffused lighting you can throw at it. Product photography is not just sharp shadows and arch props. It's finding relatable ways to make any mundane product influence a viewer so much that they spend their hard earned dollars on a box of cookies. The biggest advertising dollars don't go to big fancy brands and products. If you wanna be a still life photographer, odds are you're not gonna be shooting Gucci's and Porsches. Someone does do that and that job does exist, but there's way more advertising dollars spent into brands like H&M and Christie and McDonald's because that's where the competition is. When someone wants to buy a Ferrari, there's nothing else quite like it. If you're gonna go buy a Ferrero Rocher, there's a million other options in the checkout line. What do you see the most ads for? Fast cars or fast food? So learn to make the most out of the mundane because that's where the money is in the long run anyway. Anyway. Thanks for sticking around. I really appreciate you all who make it here to the end. Here's a video you might've missed if you're a recent subscriber and I'll see you guys next week. Peace.